Welcome to Keeping the World Company on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about a wider war. Will a wider war erupt in the Middle East? What are the factors in play? Our guest for the show is Gene Rosenfeld, an independent scholar. Welcome to the show, Gene. Thank you, Jay. So much is happening or not happening, as the case may be, in the Middle East with these peace discussions. And I wonder if you could get us current on what is going on or not going on with respect to the peace negotiation. Well, it's really hard to determine that. The latest article I have seen on it from the Times of Israel by David Horowitz um, seems pretty much in the loop and is very indeterminate about the negotiations going on both in Cairo and Doha. We have sent a delegation that includes Nicholas Burns, the head of the CIA, and Israel has sent a delegation, including the head of its intelligence agency, Shin Bat, and also a representative of the Israeli Defense Force, the, the army, the, the armed forces, um, <clears throat> and the Mossad. Um, so uh, Hamas has not sent a delegation to participate. They, they are standing aside. Egypt and Qatar are the two uh, countries most involved. Qatar, as you know, has a, kind of a pipeline to Hamas and the uh, axis of resistance, which includes other uh, asymmetric organizations under supposedly the aegis of Iran, which is really prosecuting this war. In the meantime, Israel, which assassinated the head of Hamas, who was in Tehran at the time for the installation of uh, Iran's new prime minister, that assassination of Ismail Haniya set off alarm bells. Uh, Iran considered that a, a major provocation and uh, said that it would um, retaliate in a major way against Israel. But in effect, Iran is standing back right now and is not retaliating to see what the status of this ceasefire negotiation will be. Secondly, or thirdly, I should say, the United States is undergoing uh, the final stages of its uh, major presidential election and the Democratic Convention is going on right now. We have a Democratic president, Joe Biden, who is directing uh, Anthony Blinken uh, and the United States team in the negotiations. And they have a stake in keeping the Palestinian issue quiet, the Gazan issue quiet. They have protesters under control in Chicago um, who are not getting a lot of press right now because everything is in abeyance with this negotiation. So there are both domestic and foreign factors at play, one greatest of which is a wider war in the Middle East, should both Iran and Hezbollah decide to attack Israel at the same time, which means that we have sent carrier groups uh, to the Mediterranean, in addition to the carrier group we have there, uh, threatening Iran with major re uh, retaliation should they wage a huge attack on Israel. I hadn't mentioned that Israel, the day before it assassinated the head of Hamas in Tehran, uh, assassinated a long-term, long-time Palestinian Hezbollah activist who was the mastermind of the Beirut uh, barracks bombings during the Reagan administration in 1983 that killed 241 American servicemen and got us out of Lebanon. He also masterminded uh, the hijacking of uh, a flight, TWA flight, and has been very active in the 2006 war between Israel and Hezbollah, the last all-out war that Hezbollah, which is also a member of the Axis of Resistance and a protege of Iran, uh, has waged. 
And that was an indeterminate war because Hezbollah has been building underground tunnels just like Hamas has in Gaza. And they've been beefing up their air warfare and their missiles so that Israel is now facing uh, a second front in its war on its northern border, which it has evacuated up, up to 160,000 Israelis are evacuated from the north because Hezbollah has made that a no man's land. The situation is incredibly complex, but the tinderbox has never been so close to being on fire from one spark. So many things in play. Um, it, it makes me sad to think that we we don't we're not even close to peace. And uh, these guys that um, that uh, the Israelis assassinated. So that's what two, two maybe. Um, what about the you know the hostages? What about the the half a dozen additional hostages they found dead in Gaza? Are they are they not worth the same as these people who were assassinated? Well, you know, do people not understand that a life is a life? Do the people who are protesting in Chicago not understand that a life is a life? Uh, I, I do not understand the uh, a asymmetrical quality of this moral, um, you know, this moral need for vengeance by Iran and Hezbollah and Hamas, uh, when in fact they have killed so many people, you know, uh, intentionally, willfully, brutally, what, 1,200, 1,300 Israelis, uh, just quite remarkable, but two or three of the masterminds of that violence. Oh, and they're all upset. And the people who are, um, you know, protesting in Chicago, uh, they they see it the same way that Hamas and Hezbollah and the Iranians see it. They're so upset about the Palestinians, but they don't think too much about the hostages and all the Jews who were killed on October seventh. I just I just had to say that. But you know what? You know the thing. I, I read the Horowitz article that you mentioned, and I want to. I want to add a point and see what your thought is. Okay, so Hamas doesn't want to come. Hamas is the principal adversary. Hamas is the organization that started this. Hamas is the one that killed all those Israelis and still holds the hostages. But Hamas doesn't want to come. How in the world can you have a peace negotiation? when uh, the principal, the ones who started it all, uh, refused to participate. Let me say that I do not think they can have a peace settlement if Hamas does not participate. What you see on the surface is not necessarily what is actually the dynamic that is operating. And that's true with Hamas too. Hamas is not actively at the table. It doesn't want to be at the table. Hamas, however, is in Cairo. It's there. They have participants ready to participate. Um, there's a report from Antony Blinken that Netanyahu has signed off on the United States' latest rendition of this ceasefire proposal. It supposedly meets his four requirements, um, which have to do with a hostage exchange have to do with uh, Israel remaining on the Egyptian border in what's called the Philadelphia Corridor, which is <laughs> looks a little bit like our southern border with the wall, and also on the uh, Netzarim uh, line, which divides North and South Gaza because Hamas has been re-infiltrating North Gaza, which is a no man's land, but they're still there. They still have their tunnels. So Israel has had to go back time and again to the same locations to, quote, pacify territory in North Gaza, as well as go after Hamas in South Gaza. The war is very much progressing. But those are the four um, conditions that Netanyahu has set. Now they say the ball is in Hamas's court to accept or reject uh, the latest version of the proposal. But Blinken <laughs> has kind of soft pedaled this and saying both sides need maximum flexibility. They're only discussing the first phase of the proposal, which is for six weeks 
and a Palestinian for Israeli partial hostage exchange um, and for Israel maintaining control of those two lines uh, halfway across Gaza and at the southern border of Gaza to make sure there's no re-infiltration of Hamas on either end. And so we don't know uh, if Hamas is going to accept or reject this very soft version of uh, maximum flexibility where they can continue to fine tune and implement it. The fine tuning is in the implementation. Once they accept it on paper, they have to then implement it. This will take more negotiations. So we're not at the end of negotiations, but I think Blinken's trying to carry this a significant step forward at the same time he wants to keep Iran at bay, keep Iran from staging this retaliatory attack on Israel, and to some extent Hezbollah as well. That's the kind of um, statesmanlike geopolitical view on what's going on in the Middle East. However, as you know, I've been doing more deep dives into human behavior and how human beings experience um, these kinds of conflicts and how they respond, how, how we as, as human beings, not as Gazans or Israelis or Palestinians, but how human beings in general respond. And I also have read some very interesting things about this very long-term war between Palestinians and Israelis. This war has been going on since 1948. There have been pauses, but it has basically been like those recalcitrant um, conflicts like the uh, between Ireland and, and uh, England for, for years and years. It's been a, an 80 year conflict essentially with, with a lot of kinetic wars. The attitudes of, is, of Palestinians and Israelis reached a high point toward a settlement in 1993 with the Oslo Accords. You may recall that Norway took um, uh, took place, uh, took a place at the table and uh, hammered out these Oslo Accords, which was the, the basic foundation of a two-state solution. And that was before, of course, things heated up with Hezbollah and Iran. And that there was a lot of hope at that time. I recall in the United States what it felt like too. Finally, we we're going to resolve this Mideast crisis. But then, of course, there was an assassination of the Israeli uh, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, who was a hardcore general who basically decided he was for a two-state solution. And he was assassinated in Tel Aviv by an extreme zealot of the Israeli right wing. Interestingly, that man is still in prison, but his attitudes are represented by, believe it or not, the coalition partners that Netanyahu now has to deal with in getting this solution. Since 1993, both Israelis and Palestinians have endured other wars, rocket attacks, um, retaliations to the degree, intifadas, to the degree that the general feeling is one of either one side or the other is going to win, but they can't both win. Hamas is just as dug in with its new head who replaced Hania, uh, Yahya Sinwar. He is perhaps the hardest line Hamas operative <laughs> that has been around for you know, as many years as Hamas has been around. And he was the guy who planned October 7th. He is now in charge. So who you have facing the table are representatives of despair. The coalition partners for Netanyahu, um, uh, <clears throat> Ben Gavir and Katz, for example, are almost in rebellion against Netanyahu himself and do not want a solution. They want the complete eradication of Hamas. On the other hand, you have Yahya Sinwar, who was dedicated 
to Hamas's former charter, which it sort of papered over and put lipstick on a pig, that wants the total eradication of Israel. And the people, unfortunately, are beginning to take a harder line behind both of them. There were Palestinian civilians in the afternoon of October 7th who followed the militants into southern Israel and committed war crimes and atrocities and, and killings and massacres of men, women, and children uh, in southern Israel, and then paraded corpses of people throughout the streets of Gaza. And there were Palestinian civilians insulting and spitting on these bodies. So Israelis don't have a lot of love uh, left over for Palestinians. And then you have, unfortunately, on the Israeli side, over this long, hard war, Israelis for existence have developed two doctrines, which are really, really harsh doctrines. The first one is called uh, the Hannibal Directive. And the Hannibal Directive uh, allows the IDF to kill Israeli civilians if they are uh, in a, inextricably connected with the hostiles they are fighting. So if you have a car full of, say, a couple of hostages and a bunch of militants and they're targeted, they can be killed uh, without repercussions by the Israeli army. And the other one is just as harsh if not harsher toward Palestinians, it's the uh, Dania, uh, Dania Doctrine, which is based on a, a, a neighborhood in Lebanon where Israelis came in with maximum force and um, there were many civilian casualties. And this directive says, this doctrine says uh, in the midst of hostilities, severe hostilities, the Israeli army can use disproportionate force. And this is what we've seen in the Gaza war. We have presumably 40,000 civilian casualties, although no doubt at least a third of them are militant casualties, but nevertheless, it's a big number. Versus on the Israeli side, approximately less than 2,000 casualties, even counting their military casualties. So you see the effect of this Dania doctrine. That does not sell well in the United States or abroad among this generation of young people uh, who only see destruction and death. Well, let me offer some thoughts um, about these, quote, negotiations. Uh, I don't know wh whether you're optimistic or not, but I am not optimistic at all. I, and I'd like to refer back to Ron Moon, who, is, who died a few years ago, who was on the Supreme Court of Hawaii, and who was known as the best settlement judge we had on the circuit court. And uh, he would invite counsel for all the parties to come into his chambers, and he would settle cases. And he had a remarkable uh, success rate in settling cases. And I can recall being in his chambers... Uh, when one of the parties didn't want to show up, um, where the lawyer for the party didn't want to show up, or the lawyer would show up and say, I have no authority. Okay, And Ron Moon would say, oh, no, that's not going to work. You have to be here. You have to be here with authority, or I'm going to take it out against your client. He knew that these cases never settled unless all the parties are at the table. The fact that Hamas is in the room as a you know quiet observer to these negotiations is nothing. They're not participating. They're not committing themselves. They're not they're not speaking. They're not they're not articulating positions, yes or no. And and the result is uh, Ron Moon would never let these negotiations quote go forward because he knows it's not sincere that it will never work. They will never agree. They will use it as propaganda, maybe. Um, they will use it as a way to lever a better deal for themselves. They will never buy into what uh, Biden and Blinken are suggesting. Uh, they will never agree with what Israel is agreeing to. Um, and therefore, just knowing the humanity of that, I know that's not particularly philosophical 
um, you know, or at, at an academic level. But let me say that I, from my experience in negotiating solutions between uh, factions that are in controversy, it never works unless all the parties are at the table with authority in front of somebody who can actually hammer a settlement home. So I am not optimistic. I think this is just a, a you know, a kabuki, if you will. It's it's never going to work. But there's a reason for Biden and Blinken to do this. There's a reason, I suppose, for Netanyahu to do it too, because it buys time. This is all about time. <clears throat> they cannot afford to have a war happen during or uh, during the Democratic National Convention this week, that would be so ill-advised and so destructive to the Democrats. Um, and I think everybody in the Middle East knows that if Trump were elected, uh, he would be on oh. Israel's side and he would be hammering on Iran and the terrorists. And they really don't want him to be the president because they know that uh, Kamala Harris is much more humane and sympathetic to populations like the Palestinians. So <clears throat> it's not a good idea to have this erupt during the, the Democratic National Convention. Furthermore, the same analysis applies from the time of the Democratic National Convention um, through September, October, uh, and until uh, Election Day, because you have the same kind of affair. It would turn voters one way or the other uh, in this country. It would put pressure on Biden and Blinken and Harris. Uh, that would create a real problem. So Biden, Blinken, and Harris would all like to see this, as you said, keep quiet, kept quiet. Um, they don't want to see it erupt. Erupting is not a good thing for the Democratic Party and for the election of Harris. It would be a good thing for Trump. I'm afraid to say, because this, this is the sort of scenario that he would uh, endorse. Um, in terms of reaching an agreement between now and the end of the week, or now and the end of October, very, very unlikely. From all that I know about the human experience in trying to resolve uh, disputes and controversies, this is never, ever going to happen. Look back. Look back at all the 80 years of controversy. We have never gotten close to a lasting peace. Never. And the Israelis have surely tried. And, and then the terrorists blow them up yet again. And then the Israelis and the right wing of the Israelis get more and more aggravated. And they get angry. And their positions harden. But the, the violence, may, may I say, in my perception, the violence always starts with the terrorists. And the reaction always starts with the Israelis. Now, what we have is, is um, an interesting moment where Iran has come out. Iran is out of the closet. Everybody knows this is a war between Israel, um, Israel as a, as a friend of the United States, uh, and Iran. And it, it has every, every likelihood of turning into a much wider war. Uh, and there's talk about that in the press. Uh, in the media. Um, people want to see that happen because it would finally resolve this. Of course, it would mean, you know, perhaps the destruction of Israel and th the killing of an, a great number of people in the Middle East. But right now, what we have is untenable. It's never going to get resolved. And this is another, just another example of how attempts at peace negotiations haven't worked over these 80 years it won't work now. I agree with you. I, I do differ somewhat in that I do believe that there was uh, a couple of times during these 80 years when we were much closer to a solution. And one of those times was in the 1990s during the Oslo Accords. Um, both um, leaders at that time, which I believe were Arafat and Rabin, were awarded the Nobel Prize. And then we have to go back to Jimmy Carter and Camp David and the peace between Egypt and Israel that he brokered, which was a lasting peace. And then just before October 7th, 
there was almost the implementation of the Abraham Accords, which meant that there would be peace between Saudi Arabia, the head of the Arab world, um, the, the curator of Mecca, the sacred center of Islam throughout the world, and Israel. So the acceptance of Israel has proceeded along with the deepening enmity between the Palestinians and the Israelis. It's kind of a paradox because as Israel has shown itself to be a very efficient defender of its own territory, and it has uh, at times had to face up to five hostile countries at one time, and that was in 1948 when it first started and was at its weakest. Um, Israel has, over time, been able to outlast its neighbors and to create agreements between itself and Jordan, um, itself and, and Egypt, uh, and, and almost between itself and Saudi Arabia, which is now on pause. At the same time that Iran is becoming more of a player and has emerged in its uh, full regalia as a hostile uh, party against Israel, um, Iran is standing aside. What does it take for Iran to stand aside and wait to see how a negotiation turns out? A terrific amount. Anybody who's had anything to do with Iran as the government knows. It's one of the hardest governments to negotiate with. And this is because of the religious factor, which is so understudied. And as a historian of religions, it's always been so apparent to me that it's the religion factor that causes these hardline stances that people take. It was the reason for the assassination of Yitzhak uh, Rabin and the scuttling of the Oslo Accords. It was the reason given by the axis of resistance in Hamas to attack Israel on October 7th, a religious holiday, by the way, in Israel, Simchat Torah, and to, um, in, in, in retaliation for uh, an uh, uh, incursion on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, which is really an insult to the Islamic world. So the religious factor has to be taken into consideration here. That's not to say that that was any different in Ireland. Ireland had a religious factor. You recall the religious wars between the Protestants and the Catholics in Northern Ireland. This, um, the, the Irish uh, conflict went on for generations. It, it included many terrorist attacks and attacks on civilians. These conflicts can be resolved. That they take is a lot of time and dedication. Yes, uh, theoretically, over time, maybe hundreds of years, uh, they might be resolved. But if you look at the 80-year period that we're talking about, and if you look right now, you see that it's getting worse, not better. You see that the anti-Semitism is so hardened in all of these countries and terror organizations, being supported by Putin, um, you know, and and other autocrats around the world. I mean, it seems like it's getting worse every day, and and you know, so from here to peace is a very very long road. I want to mention that uh, Thomas Friedman, who I sometimes agree with, other times I do not. Um, came up in his most recent article with what he said was the solution. And the solution was um, to, and maybe it goes back to the old two-state approach, which seems to have been debunked as a matter of fact. But his notion is that if the Israelis can make a deal with the um, what Palestinian organization in, in, the, in, the, in the West Bank, Palestinian Liberation Organization, um, then they can undercut uh, Iran's anti-Semitism. Um, and if they can do that, they will somehow diffuse all of these terror organizations and proxies, which are funded and controlled by Iran. I thought it was a creative thought, 
Uh, I thought it was very hard to achieve that. But that's what that's what his solution was. Your thoughts about that possibility? I, I don't put a lot into that possibility. I don't think the Palestinian Authority stands for any major Palestinian faction today. The Palestinian Authority is really like a um, intermediary between its population on the West Bank and the Israeli government. It pledges to carry out the directives of the Israeli government over the Palestinian people. So it's not regarded as a force that represents their grievances and goals of regaining the territory and the properties that they had to leave. This so-called right of return, where if there were a two-state solution, uh, Palestinians would negotiate for returning to their familial properties that they either fled from or were cast out from during the so-called Nakba or disaster of 1948. Um, the return of territory is very, very unlikely. I have had some ideas about thinking out of the box with the settlements. The settlements have actually been a strong policy of the Israeli nationalists headed up by Netanyahu and Sharon and Likud, which creates de facto on the ground facts of Israeli uh, residents in the West Bank territory, breaking up the rest West Bank territory. My out of the box thought was, well, there is a lot of land um, east of Gaza in Israel, in uh, the desert, where uh, perhaps in response to the taking of West Bank land, Palestinians could be granted land in Israel in that area to create their own cities and places of residence. That's a very out-of-the-box thought I haven't heard anybody come up with. I really wonder about the whole land issue. If you look at a map um, of the Middle East, um, and you can see that Iran, for example, is huge. It is, it is the you know, capstone of the whole region. It is huge. Israel is a tiny sliver. Uh, it, it is tiny. You can hardly see it on the same map. I don't know why everybody wants to have this contention about land in Israel. There's land in all of these uh, neighboring countries uh, that could go to the Arabs and redeem them from what they consider the outrage of the Nakba. It just seems to me that this is not based on land. It is based on anti-Semitism. It is based on the fact that how many generations have come through that 80 years, and they have been taught by their teachers, their parents, their friends, their community, their entire society to hate Jews and to destroy Judaism from the river to the sea. They, they, that is central core to their whole life, the life of their world, their community, their culture. <clears throat> so... I think, you know, if you want to take 100 or 200 years and head for some kind of long-term arrangement for peace, um, you have to deal with that. And right now, that's worse than it's ever been. I have to disagree in terms of how you look at this, because everything that I have ever studied about groups of people comes right down to the constant that Land and territory is an ultimate concern in terms of identity. You cannot have a national identity without having a piece of land that you identify with. That's a basic. So whether it's a one-state solution or a two-state solution, Palestinians are not going to feel reconciled if they're out in a diaspora, out in the Arab world. Just as Jews have never come to terms in 2,000 years living in a diaspora outside of their promised land. So the, the root cause of this and the bitterness 
uh, really is that it is two indigenous people fighting over the same piece of land. There has to be a solution one way or another so that people feel they are living in their homeland and have a national identity. Hmm. Okay, well, it's okay that we don't agree on everything. I'm sorry, but there, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> but let me, let me give you 100 years. I'm going to give you 100 years, and I'm going to give you oh. control of the, you know, of the Israeli government during that period. And I'm going to say, Gene, okay, you have 100 years to make peace. Uh, in the circumstances we now see, what do you do? What is your strategy to make peace, given that, you know, huge swath of time? I think that both sides, again, I'm going to go back to Nafis Hamid in the, the UK, who found that in any negotiation between two people who, at this point, according to an Israeli uh, think tanker, don't even regard each other as human beings. Don't regard the other as a human being, basically. That's the where, where they're at right now. What you have to do is sit down and acknowledge their pain. Have to accept them first as human beings. We have to get to that bottom rung of the ladder. What's Second, the pain of the Palestinians in Gaza? Israel gave them Gaza. And uh, Clinton, you know, who was uh, one of the architects of the Oslo Accords and, you know, uh, lots of efforts to make peace, he gave them money so they could make it, uh, what, the, uh, the, the Switzerland of the Mediterranean, I forget what they called it. It was going to be a huge tourist uh, uh, organization that would earn tons of money because it was on the Mediterranean. It's, it's got all of the, you know, resources that you could have to become a modern and attractive state. Um, but they took that money, billions, and they uh, and they made tunnels. Um, how, how can you change that way of thinking? Um, that they, they elected Hamas, they made tunnels, and war after war, they went and killed Jews. Uh, Jews did not start those wars. Jews are peaceful. The people at the music festival on October 7th, they weren't out to attack anybody. But the young people, uh, maybe the old people too, uh, in Gaza, of which Hamas had complete control, they could have done anything. They could have had a music festival too. But instead, they applied their resources to killing Jews and trying to you know, destroy the, the state of Israel. So how can you fix that? You have a hundred years to do it. You have to first acknowledge that you're a human being, and then you have to acknowledge. I don't acknowledge that people who come and rape and kill women, defenseless civilian women and babies, I don't acknowledge, and I don't think a lot of Israelis would, and keep them as hostages. I don't think Israelis would consider them human beings. It's very hard to understand that. Um, it's very hard to, to say, okay, let's reason together. Jay, we're not talking about the people who were there uh, uh, massacring Israelis in a pogrom. We're talking about the vast populations, families that live in Gaza. A very highly educated population, by the way, with great potential. However, they were enclosed, enfenced uh, by a superior power that was that was uh, in putting millions of dollars in the pipeline each month to a corrupt government with a medieval mindset. And I can't explain to you in five minutes or less how you undo bad governance because there are so many countries in the world that suffer from it and the people and populations that suffer from it. So I can't explain that in this amount of time, or even, you know, even if I had more time, perhaps, but I would take a stab at it. You ask me, theoretically, what I would do if I had the power to bring people together, uh, Palestinians and Israelis, on the territory that 
Israel now controls, how to defuse this conflict. And I think we have to look to other examples like the Irish example and examine carefully how they did it. I also feel that it's a land issue primarily and one side has to give and the other side has to give. You know, it's interesting that in the Jewish language in Hebrew, I found out that the word for negotiation is give and take. They don't use it. That's literally what it translates as. And what that conveys is you have to give, but you also get to take. But you can't take without giving. You can't give without taking. And so there's this zero-sum game mentality behind the cultures of both sides that you have to acknowledge. So that means concretely when you implement this, some land has to be given up and some land has to be taken. So, so that's where you start. Okay. And that's where we end. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Jean. This is an interesting discussion. It's obviously hanging by a thread. Uh, there is the very real possibility we will have a wider war. Every element, um, you know, uh, that would that would feed into that is available, is in play, that could happen anytime. But this is something that you and I will have to cover and follow going forward. And we'll see. We'll, we'll see what people do. Well, thank you, Jane. Greatly you. appreciate your thoughts, your study. And I look forward to our next discussion. Thank you, Jane.